Chris. Uh, this is the CRM for Sales webinar, and we're actually running two of these events. The event today is based around CRM for new business sales, and we're running a second webinar uh, later in February on the 22nd, focused around CRM for account management teams. So please join us for that as well if you can, uh, and let's get started. So today we're really going to focus on, on three main topic areas. Um, firstly, the importance of a sales process. In order to really drive CRM effectively inside a sales organization, we think it's key to have defined your sales process. We're going to talk a bit about the best approach to doing that. Then we're going to talk about CRM for sales leaders, the types of tools, techniques, and approaches that you can take as a sales leader to try and grow revenues and maximize your investment in sales teams. And then lastly, we're going to talk about CRM very much from a salesperson's perspective. Um, if CRM is going to be effective inside an organization, it's really key that the sales team are engaged are actually using the technology. So we're going to talk about ways that we can drive that adoption and provide real value to the salespeople rather than it just being a tool in which to input data. So let's start by looking at the uh, importance of a sales process. Um, for those of you that run sales teams, you'll know that selling is a combination of art, you know, good quality salesmanship, but also science, having a well-defined process and knowledge of the sales engagement. And really, rather than leave that knowledge locked up inside the best salespeople, inside their heads, it makes a lot of sense to try and define and document and share that information with the broader team. Now, a well-defined sales process really can improve your conversion rates inside an organization and grow your top-line revenues. One of the key objectives in defining your sales process really is about having a common framework and language to manage leads and opportunities for your business. So when you talk about a lead being qualified or an opportunity closing, everybody in the organization understands what that means uh, and what stage in the sales process it really, it really is. It also allows people to understand where they are in the sales process. Are we right at the beginning, where we're building value, trying to build a business case, or are we at the end of the sales process where we're trying to close out a deal and maximize the revenue opportunity for the business? And if that's well understood, it makes the process of providing content and messaging for the business much more effective. Again, with a well-defined sales process, your marketing team can be providing the right content in the right part of the sales cycle. So whether it's content at the beginning to build value, or it's content at the end to build credibility, for, for example, through reference accounts, um, you can pin the marketing content around the sales processes and make sure that the sales and marketing teams are working together and that process is optimized. It also ensures best practice. So you know, if you've got a number of really great salespeople who know in every sales engagement they really need to uh, cover, for example, the finance director in a deal cycle, or they always need to talk to procurement, well, rather than having that best practice locked up in their brains, and as we all know, salespeople can leave organizations, let's define and document it so the entire team are covering all those bases effectively and raising the game across the sales organization, not just with your top performers. And lastly, it's about measuring success at each of the stages and then driving improvements as required. So for example, if we're generating a lot of leads, but those leads are really falling early in the sales cycle, we might question whether we're generating the right shape or type of leads from the right, right types of sources. But if we're losing deals right at the end of the sales process, do we have a pricing issue? Do we have a contract issue? Do we have a competitive positioning issue? We need to understand why we're losing deals at the end of the sales cycle and try and improve that part of the process too. And if we well define the process, if the stages are well understood, we can measure and manage each stage in the process. So let's talk about some recommendations. Your sales process really should cover both marketing and sales. So everybody that's involved in generating new business and closing that business understands the terminology and the processes that we're looking to scale across the sales organization. Generally speaking, we would advise you to keep it relatively straightforward. Um, it's best not to try and micromanage this process. It's best to have simple and clearly defined stages so that people understand where they are in the sales process. And complexity, 
can breed confusion, particularly if you don't have a process to find inside your organization today. And your sales stages really should reflect not only your requirements, but also recognize that the customers also want a journey with you. Um, and they are also going through a qualification process with you as a vendor. So for example, qualified. You know, that might mean that we believe that the prospective customer is the right shape and fit for us. But it also should mean that we think the customer feels the same about us as a vendor. Do they feel that we are the potential partner they could do business with in the future? And if you build your sales processes and your sales stages around not only your requirements, but also your customers' requirements, then it will lead to a more effective and streamlined sales engagement for your sales teams. And lastly, a bit of advice. In our experience, activity does not really constitute a sales stage. So for example, quoting a client or attending a meeting. You know, some customers will look for pricing in a quote very early in a sales process because they want to get ballpark pricing, understand roughly what it's going to cost. Or they might ask for, ask for pricing right at the end of the sales process where they're looking to put together all the paperwork and close down a deal. So providing pricing, generally speaking, is not a, a representative of a state of progression inside a sales process, it's an activity that we do. Uh, and I think it helps to think about the, the process you go through rather than the things that you do uh, in order to clearly define your sales processes. So to help illustrate that point, um, this is the sales and marketing funnel that we use here at Workbooks. If we look at the top of the funnel, we generate leads as a business, and those leads all come in into the funnel, and then we, we identify the first stage as being marketing qualified leads, so leads that are the right shape for our organization, and that's how we effectively measure the marketing organization. So marketing qualified leads then progress into what we call sales qualified leads, and these are the leads that the sales team are actively going to progress and attempt to qualify. Um, and that early stage of our sales process, the leads, MQLs to SQLs process, is all managed by our business development teams. Their objective is to deliver what we call a BANTS qualified lead or BANTS qualified opportunity into our field sales team. So most of you will be familiar with the BANTS mnemonic. It's a way of describing a sales qualification process. It's not uh, unique to workbooks, but it stands for budget, authority, need, time scale, and size. And it's a, a mnemonic that we use to identify whether a deal is appropriately qualified. Do we believe the client has a budget, or do we believe we understand how the client might get a budget signed off? What's the authority process? So which people are going to be involved in um, deciding whether to progress and approve the spend? What's the need of the customer, and are we a good fit for that need? What's the time scales of the opportunity and what's the size? Uh, and that's really the first fully qualified stage in our sales process. And from bants to engaged, engaged to preferred, and preferred down to one, that part of the sales process is managed by our field sales team. So we have clear delineation between marketing and sales and where the handover point is. Now clearly we don't win all of our deals. Um, some deals we, we lose occasionally, and some deals we qualify out of. But we mark those as different activities or different stages. So when we qualify out of a deal, we, we clearly separate it from a deal that we lost versus a deal that we won. So hopefully you can see using a, a, a funnel, using a set of sales stages, we can begin to look at how we then embed that process inside CRM and use that knowledge to underpin our sales execution processes for the new business teams and hopefully drive and improve sales execution and revenue across the organization. So let's go on to look at CRM for new business sales leaders. How do we um, help new business teams grow and develop their sales pipeline and close more deals. Well, for those of you that manage sales teams, you'll know that it's a, a continuous process of improvement. Um, we've always got room for improvement across the organization, whether it's sales, marketing, individual sales execution. And really, what we're looking to do is, is measure our current performance, analyze 
what's working, what's not working across the teams. Then look to improve that in performance by making some changes maybe, maybe doing some coaching, maybe doing some changing. And from that grow our revenues and then continue that entire process again. So if we consider to be CRM to be a journey and that we're always continuing to look to improve our execution across the sales teams, then how do we use CRM to underpin that strategy? Well, firstly, we can look at sales pipeline metrics. So we can analyze what's occurring across our sales pipeline. What's our lead flow looking like? How many deals are we winning? What's our conversion rates looking like by rep, by stage? What's the average age of our pipe? What's our win-loss analysis? What's the movement of our pipe or the velocity of our pipe? And there is a theme there around managing your pipeline and understanding the dynamics of your pipeline and looking to improve that pipeline flow. That will also underpin your forecasting because if we know how our pipeline flows, then we can more accurately predict the outcome of our pipeline activity, whether that's won or lost, and hopefully provide the right kind of forecast back into the business. But the other thing we're looking to do with CRM is improve the execution of our team, our salespeople. And so we can also look at specifically the performance of the individual sales reps to manage and coach and develop them as individuals and hopefully improve their individual performance. So we can look at things like activity levels, we can look at their meeting reports, we can talk about deal planning, how we, how we manage an individual sales cycle, what their conversion rates are like, what their pipeline, pipeline movements are like and so on. So by looking at the, uh, the CRM platform as a tool to measure both our pipeline and measure our individual salespeople, we can hopefully measure, analyze, improve, and then grow our revenues to really drive top line sales performance of the organization. So let's talk in a bit more detail about, about how we can achieve that. Let's start with the basics. So this should be a report that all of you have inside your CRM platform today if you have one, and if you don't, we'll probably have it in a spreadsheet somewhere. But this report shows, in this, this example, a workbooks report of closed one performance for sales for Q2. So what I can see quite quickly is that a number of my sales guys are over target, which is the good news. I've got one that's a long way behind target, Dylan. And according to this data, Tony's the top of my sales leaderboard. He's our, he's our top sales guy so far. So that's a good starting point. We've got some metrics now we can begin to use. You can see that my target here is 400K and I'm not too far from that. But let's dive down and look in a bit more detail of this particular data set. So what I've got on the screen now is I've analyzed those sales and I'm looking at the conversion rates. So how many opportunities did it take me to win this amount of business from my pipeline? And you'll see at the bottom of the screen that it took 95 deals in pipe of which we won 31 and we lost the remainder or qualified out of the remainder. And therefore our conversion rate for this particular sales team is about 33% or one in three. So that's okay, you know, good overall performance, but let's break that down by the individual sales reps. So Tony, who actually has sold the most in overall value terms, is converting slightly below average at about 30%. So it took in 17 deals to close five. Whereas I look at his colleague, Alison, well, Alison's actually got a much better conversion rate. She only ran 16 sales cycles and she closed eight of hers. So her hit rate is actually quite a bit better than Tony's. And I guess I've got another red flag here as well. I can see Dylan. Uh, Dylan is my least performing sales rep so far and he's got a conversion rate of 25%. Um, so he's converted only five out of 20 deals that he, he's run. And interestingly, Jane, at the top of the screen, has closed every deal she's been involved with. So Jane's new to my sales team, uh, but the early signs are that she's, a, she, she's an interesting performer and maybe a, maybe a star for the future. So let's look at that data now. What have we learned? So we learned that Dylan needs some help. 
he's not delivering his numbers and his conversion rates aren't great. Our overall win rate's about 33%. So, and Allison's got the best conversion rate and Jane could be an emerging star. And Tony, who sold the most, might benefit from some coaching. But what else could we be look, looking at within that data set? So I've not done all the reports here, but I could have easily looked at the average time that those deals were in the pipe. So in this example, it was three months. So what's the average time between the created date and the close date of these deals? And what's the average deal size? In this example, it was 10 grand. Now that information is useful for me because it's going to help me plan my pipeline for the future. And we're going to talk about that a little later on in the presentation. Let's start by looking at activity management. So now I've got some idea of what's going on with my pipeline. Let's look at my salespeople and what are they doing. Well, again, here's a, another management report inside Workbooks, which is synchronizing or, or showing you all the activities that my sales team have done. Now, this data would typically be synchronized in from Outlook or synchronized in from, uh, from Google Calendar. And it provides a real-time view inside CRM of all the meetings, all the phone calls, all the proposals that my sales team have done. Now, not surprisingly, you know, Tony's been pretty busy because he's been involved in a lot of sales cycles and he's doing lots of meetings. D Dylan, who I already know wasn't performing that well, well actually when I look at his data here, he hasn't done very much really in the last two weeks. He's only done 18 activities. So either he's not using CRM really, or he's not doing enough activity. I can also look at the overdue data. So what, what, what's overdue in, this, in the CRM? system, what activities and phone calls were meant to have taken place but haven't because the sales team haven't been able to get to them. And again, I can see that Dylan is the top of that list. So that gives me an indication that he's got data in CRM, but he really isn't following up effectively on his opportunities and activities, whereas the rest of my sales team are pretty much on top of everything. There's a few overdue things in here, but I'd expect some of that if they're busy people. So now I'm increasingly concerned about Dylan. I've got some insight into the fact that he's not delivering his numbers, his conversion rates aren't great, and actually he just doesn't look like he's engaged enough in the sales process. So what do we know so far? So we know that one in three deals close, our average deal cycle is 10K, and our sales cycle is three months. That means, by looking ahead to next quarter, I need at least 1.5 million pounds of qualified pipe. If I'm gonna win, one third of that to deliver the 500k target that I've got in Q3. I also know that because I'm going to burn through the vast majority of my, of my opportunities in that sales process in that three month period, I need marketing to, to, be, to be delivering another 150 new opportunities in Q3 to build up the pipe for Q4. So now I've got some clear targets for my team and I've got some clear targets for marketing on what they need to deliver to underpin the sales success. And I've been able to derive that data from looking at my performance last quarter from my sales team. Where it gets interesting is when I go, well, okay, if I can improve my overall conversion rate from 33% to 40%, then actually my top line revenue generation in Q4 is going to be 600,000. If I can, if I can close 40% of all my pipeline. So just by improving the performance of our sales team, improving the conversion metrics of our sales team, with the same size pipe, I can deliver more output. And that's a great example that if we can coach Dylan, maybe coach Tony, maybe leverage some of the best practice that we've got going on from Allison across the entire sales organization, I could look to grow my revenues with actually no change in the overall pipe or the overall marketing output. So, I now know I need 1.5 million pounds worth of pipe for next quarter, so I'm going to look at my pipe. And here's, a, again, a, a typical report that we can run from Workbooks that breaks down my uh, sales team by pipe. So I can see, broken down by the different stages of my sales process, we talked about clearly defining the sales process stages earlier, what's going on. So the good news is, <coughs> excuse me,
The good news is I've got 1.3 million pounds in my pipe. The bad news is a lot of that's sitting with Dylan, who I also know is not my most effective sales guy right now, and a lot of that's sitting at stage four, the back end of the sales process. So as a sales leader, I might need to make some difficult decisions now. Am I going to leave all that with Dylan and hope he does a better job in Q3 than he did in Q2, or am I going to look at redistributing some of those deals elsewhere, or maybe provide much more one-to-one -one coaching for him to help him through that sales process? Um, but I can begin to plan, rather than just let the process take place around me, I can really look at the metrics, understand what's going on across the organization, and make some proactive changes, if appropriate, to drive and underpin the success of this sales team and make them even more effective. And, and you can see by using this, this pipeline data, I can really drive that data and drive the, the, the changes in the team that I'm looking for. So let's move on to marketing. So we talked about the fact that marketing needs to deliver us some real pipeline. So we said that marketing needs to deliver 150 leads a month. Let's set them real targets. Uh, let's clearly define what, a, what an MQL looks like. So not any lead qualifies, only leads that meet the criteria that the sales team are setting. So it, it might be organizations over a certain size, contacts from a particular vertical, uh, employee, uh, people from a particular job title, whatever makes sense for you. But if you define and then set targets for your marketing organization to deliver from a leads volume perspective, then that will begin to drive their behavior and, and make them much more accountable from the output of marketing, not just content and, and webinars and those kind of things. But I'd recommend two types of targets for marketing. I'd recommend a lead generation target, but I'd also recommend a sales accepted target. And so that's the concept of converting leads into opportunities, putting a monetary value against those opportunities, and only having the sales team accept them when they feel it's the right, the right shape and size of lead. Uh, and that way, we're not just talking about lead volumes, we're also talking about the, the monetary contribution to the pipeline that marketing can deliver. I'd also consider capping individual deals because what you don't want is a £100,000 opportunity um, when our average deal value is £10,000 massively skewing our pipeline numbers. So you might want to cap every opportunity from a marketing measurement perspective at say fifteen or £20,000. So hopefully having aligned sales and marketing from a targets perspective, I need to help marketing be more effective. Now marketing just like sales is a process of a continuous improvement. So marketing plan their campaigns, they execute their campaigns. If they're doing a good job, they want to analyze the output from their campaigns, learn what works, what doesn't work, and then reapply those learnings to the next campaign they, 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 they run. So if what happens in your organization is marketing generate leads and they disappear into an email pile and they've got no idea what happened to those leads, they're really going to struggle to improve their performance and underpin your success. So it's really important to join up the analysis, the qualified out and loss analysis from sales activities and feed that back into marketing so they understand why you qualified out or lost those deals so they can do things differently. And it's worth articulating that I think qualified out and lost are different things. So lost is typically where the customer spent money but not with you. So they bought a competitive solution or did something slightly different, but they, they took some budget and invested it in a solution which wasn't yours. And qualified out is typically where the opportunity wasn't the right shape or size for us, or we couldn't get the right level of engagement with them because they weren't ready to buy yet. And so by defining those two things differently, we can record different information against these opportunities and hopefully improve and feed back that data to marketing so they can do a more effective job. So we would, we would recommend categorizing your reasons. For example, lost reasons might be around product feature, pricing, sales execution. Let's make sure we're holding our sales guys to account. Did they do a good enough job of, pro, uh, of progressing the deal? Um, and if it's qualified out, it could be the wrong fit, too small, too large, customer didn't really have any requirements. But if we can capture that detail, we can begin to report on a TRM and then spot some real trends. And if we do have a particular trend around, for example, pricing or competitiveness, 
um, or the wrong sh wrong size of leads being generated, we can identify that relatively quickly and either feed that back into marketing, maybe look at change, changing our pricing strategy or feeding that back into the business. But the importance of taking all that knowledge that you built up in the sales process and sharing it effectively with the business can really allow you to learn and imply and improve your marketing and sales execution. So hopefully that's given you some ideas or some food for thought on how you might use CRM to drive new business generation from a sales leader's perspective. But let's look at it from a salesperson's perspective. So we talk very much about CRM must be a tool to help salespeople. It must help them turn left or right out of the drive in the morning, help them do their jobs more effectively. If CRM is just a tool for them to put data into, it's just an overhead, then it won't deliver the business outcomes that you're looking for. So let's look at some things we can do to help sales teams be more effective. So we're going to run through um, some typical activities that a sales guy would need to do and see how CRM can underpin those. So, so first one's all about prioritization. I'm a sales guy, I've got my week coming up, what am I planning, what, what do I need to focus on this week in order to maximize the outcome of my sales pipeline? I've got some visits to go and do, who else can I see? Where can I find some customer references? How do I follow best practice? So we're going to, we're going to walk through some of those examples. Let's start with my, my priorities for the week. So used effectively, CRM should really guide salespeople to know what to do first in any given day or week. Um, and that can be done using a combination of dashboards, reports, and color coding to really provide insight and draw attention to things the sales guys need to do. So here's an example of three dashboards that we would very commonly deploy inside our customers' environments. So the first one is the activity list. This is the salesperson's to-do list, typically synchronized in from Outlook, um, so it's synchronized backwards and forwards, but here I can see on the screen my list of activities for the upcoming days, um, and I've got some very specific color coding on them, and what I've also done here is join together the activity with the deal value, so I can not only just work through my activity list, but I can look at my activity list in the context of the stage the opportunity is at and the amount the opportunity is worth. And so if I'm busy, I can prioritize my time most effectively. So you'll see on this first activity list, um, the phone call to, um, to Emily is overdue, so I really should have been on top of that, which is why it's highlighted in red. And I've got an introductory phone call coming up with Blue Circle later on. Oh, I just had that an hour ago, so I need to update those notes. And as I, as I go down my list, I can see that highlighted in green a bit further down, I've got a meeting. So I probably want to plan for that meeting ahead of time and do some meeting planning, so we'll talk about that. And I've got another activity to do, which is to organize a reference call for Cheshire Industries. That's at stage four, so it's about to close out, we hope, but they want a reference site. They want to know who else they can speak to before they move ahead and place an order with you. And we're going to work out how best to find that data for, for the customer, uh, for your your prospect. I've also got some leads because marketing's delivered my uh, de delivered their inputs, um, but I've got four leads. So which one do I focus on first? So in this example, uh, we can color code them, uh, and we can use lead scoring using a, com a combination of attributes to decide, based on the shape and size of the lead, which ones are the most important to follow up on. And the one at the top of the list in green is the one that the, that we feel from a a fit perspective is the one that, that warrants the, the most priority follow-up. And at the bottom of the screen, I've got my neglected ops. So which opportunities do I have as a sales guy where I don't have a next step set? So in our world, we would believe that every opportunity should have a next step. And this is a good example of where the activity has not been created for the opportunity. And it may have been the sales guy was busy on the phone, a call came in, went to grab his lunch, and just forgot to put in the next step. But will he remember when he gets back to his desk? Will it wait three or four days? Uh, and so this report just highlights those that need to have the, the activity set for them in the future so they don't get missed and fall off the bottom of his pile. And from a sales leader's perspective, you can obviously report across your organization on those exceptions uh, and track whether people are on top of their activities or not. The other thing that we can do with CRM is we can join your website 
data with your CRM data in real time. And what I mean by that is that we can tell you who's on your website right now and what pages they're looking at. Uh, and depending on how that's implemented, we can either tell you which organizations are on your website or even which people are on your website and what pages they're looking at. So here's an example of a screen inside our CRM platform that shows you that. And what we can do here is we can actually score different pages. So you can see here that somebody looking at our pricing page, we've given a much higher score because that's normally a leading indicator they're in the sales process than if they're looking at one of the support pages on our website. And by using a combination of page scoring on your website, coupled with um, bringing that data into CRM, we can give you insight into what's really going on on your website now and how that might inform your sales process. So that's a source of new potential leads for us, and that would appear in your new leads dashboard that I showed you on the previous screen. But also, I can look at people that are in my sales process right now. So here's an example off our website of two organizations that are, are in our sales process. So Global Marine are active in our sales pipeline right now and I can see they're on the website and I can drill into that record and see what pages they were looking at. And Timco, we've qualified out of once before, but they appear to be interested again because they're back on our website looking again at our technology. And therefore, we might want to go back and revisit that opportunity and, 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 and see whether we want to bring it back into the sales funnel. So by combining your website traffic data with your real-time CRM information, we can give your sales guys insight into not only the activity of their prospects in the pipeline today, but also of potential leads in the future based on the scoring methodology that we can provide. So now we figured out what the priorities are for the week. Um, one of the things that we need to do is we all need to organize the meeting. So the meeting's booked for Wednesday, but I'm off to see them. And uh, I know they're up in Macclesfield. So using CRM here, we can actually plot which other organizations that are customers of ours are nearby. So this map shows me there are three other organizations that are in 50 miles of this account, and I could change the, um, the search radius so it's less, less distance. So I might want to maximize my sales visits if I'm going to drive all the way up to Macclesfield um, and ensure that I'm seeing at least one, if not two other organizations on that same trip. Great example of how we can just make your sales guys more productive by improving the efficiency of their meetings. Um, and this particular map, is displayed on a, a tab inside our opportunity record. So they don't even need to go and search for this data. They just need to click on the nearby customers tab and it will tell them who's nearby environmental development when they're having the meeting. So we know that we need to find a reference for one of, the, one of my deals that's about to close out. Um, well, why, why don't we store the reference data inside CRM? You know, uh, CRM is just a database in essence. So why don't we get marketing or our customer services teams to record who our customers are uh, that are reference accounts inside CRM so they're easy to find. So simple approach here, create a tick box on an organization record, say they're a customer reference. Maybe embed a link to the website case study so we can easily access it. Um, we can embed that inside an email template, for example, if we were going to mail this prospect with a breakdown of the, of the reference details. There's some notes in here about the, um, about the reference account, notes, notes on how they're using the technology. That means that as a sales guy, I can easily filter existing customers by industry or by size or by vertical or by sales territory or whatever it is <coughs> oh, Excuse me, to identify those customers that are reference accounts that I might use for this, partic this particular sales engagement. But actually, if you're using workbooks, you can make it even easier than that, because what we can do is we can put it on the opportunity record as well. So what this particular view shows you is that we're automatically matching the references that are relevant to this particular sales opportunity based on industry or, or vertical. Um, without the sales guys having to go and search for it. So again, a good example of where we're bringing that information to the fore and allowing salespeople to quickly find reference information for the sales process. 
to help them get this deal over the line and get it closed and get everybody paid. So you know, all examples here really of, of approaches that we can use to improve the lot of a sales guy or person or girl and make their jobs easier to do by providing the data and advice that they need in the right place. So let's talk about managing a deal. How can we use CRM to underpin that process? So we talked about building your best practice, uh, documenting your best practice and deploying it as part of your sales process. Well, why don't we just document some of the key steps of that inside CRM? So in our case, you know, if we want to document the BANTS process, what's the process for the budget, what's the authority, what's the need, what's the time scale, what's the size, we can very simply provide the ability to record that data inside CRM for a couple of reasons. One, it's there for us to do a deal review, so I can sit down with the sales rep or he can sit down with his manager and discuss the deal in detail. It provides best practice guidance for the individual reps because they know they need to answer the question, who's going to sign off the, the, the order and what's the process for getting budget approval. But also we can embed some logic to define red flags. So for example here on the screen you'll see we've got this risks no finance director field showing and that's because we know from experience that the vast majority of our sales processes require us to touch the finance director. And according to this opportunity, the three people related to this deal, none of them are the finance director. And so if my sales rep is going to tell me this deal is going to close, I know from experience it probably isn't. Because unless he's got involved with the finance director and got his approval, we're not going to get the order. So you can embed best practice and guidance for your, your team relatively simply by um, tailoring your CRM to follow your sales process and provide them with hints and tips and guidance on adopting that best practice. So um, hopefully that gives you some insight into the sorts of things we can do with a CRM technology to help you grow your top line revenues. So firstly defining a sales process and adopting that sales process across the organization. Secondly, by using sales, uh, CRM as a tool for your sales leaders to manage your pipeline metrics and help coach and develop your salespeople more effectively. And lastly, by using CRM to really underpin uh, your sales guys' day-to-day -day activities and make them more effective. And we've not covered everything you could do with CRM here. There's lots of other things that we could do in all these areas to improve your performance. But hopefully we've covered some interesting examples of how this can really help you grow your top-line revenues uh, and scale your business. So that's the end of the presentation now. Uh, I'm going to open up the, uh, the session for questions. So if people have got some questions, please ask them right now. Okay, so the first question I've got is, uh, you gave us some great pointers on how CRM can help new business. Uh, where should I start? What should I focus on first to have the greatest impact? Um, so I would, I would start by defining your sales process. You don't need to spend months and months doing that. You can refine it and change it as you go. But if you define your sales process and then put all of your current opportunities into that process with the right stagings and weightings, for example, then you can begin to start the measurement. Because actually what you need to know is what's currently going on. What are my conversion rates? Which are my most effective sales guys? And you might have some idea of that already. But by putting it into CRM, you can really begin to measure and understand those metrics much more effectively. So I would start with that at the beginning. Uh, and then we can go uh, from there and analyze the data. So uh, somebody asked me if the recording is going to be available later. Absolutely, it will be. Um, We'll make that available after the webinar and we'll send you an email to the link. I've got another question about Web Insights and the mapping module. So it's, someone asked me, are they third party products or are they part of Workbook CRM? Um, so they're both part of the Workbook CRM suite. Um, the mapping module is available now. 
uh, and the insights module is available in beta um, so that will be available for full production a little later in the quarter most likely March Um, so I've got a question about user adoption. Um, so user adoption can be an issue of special sales reps. How do you get them to adopt and embrace CRM? Well, that was in large part what my third part of the presentation was around. Was it, it, the key thing about salespeople is that if you're making their life more difficult and you're getting in the way of a sales process, they're not going to they're not going to thank you for it, and they're going to be less willing to adopt CRM. So your CRM tool really does have to help them. Uh, and, I, and it's about figuring out what that means for your organisation. You know, is it reference accounts? Is it um, understanding the competitive landscape? Is it managing the pipeline more effectively? And if you can figure that out, that's where to start and develop. And you will have different types of salespeople, so you do need a bit of carrot and a bit of stick. And we've got customers, for example, that won't pay commissions on deals unless they're documented in CRM. That's a good way of encouraging adoption, but it can't be all stick. It needs to be a combination of stick and carrot, uh, and I think the carrot is probably more important than the stick, and if you get that balance right, you should get good adoption, but it is without doubt one of the big challenges with any, with any CRM deployment. Um, so quite a few questions about the integration of the website with CRM. Um, so just to explain very briefly how that works, um, what happens is that we put tracking code on your website, which allows us to identify organizations visiting your website. And we do that using a combination of IP address lookup and some other clever technology. So it's not an absolute science, but it's pretty good in terms of hit rate. Uh, and we can identify organizations that are on your website now and what pages they're looking at. In addition to that, if the individual has either converted through our website previously through some kind of form, or with our new marketing automation email platform, they've clicked on an email link, we can identify them as an individual and track the individual's journey across the website. So that, that appears against the individual organization, and we can join that information into the um, CRM platform and use it to drive our sales behavior. So we, we offer some examples of carrots uh, as opposed to sticks. So carrots, I, I, I hopefully we touched on some of them. So um, activity management, I think, is key, making sure that they understand the value of that and are actively using it. Things like references, things like competitive analysis, making sure that's available in CRM. Um, another good example is matching prospective customers in your database. So you'll remember that I showed you a screenshot of um, reference accounts that match an opportunity. You could also very easily match other organizations in your database that look like your existing clients, i.e. by industry size, uh, vertical splits, uh, number of employees, for example, because if your team are hunting for new opportunities, you'll have some of those opportunities inside your database. Another simple example, have them uh, easily allow them to report on opportunities that we qualified out of historically, make that available for them to go and hunt around that account base and see whether we can we can drive more, uh, we can reopen some of those other opportunities. Carrot, things like the website integration, providing them with real-time visibility of who's on the website and accessing the website. Open clicks and bounce information coming back in from email, all examples of where it gives the sales guys insight into what's going on with their prospective customers so they can drive their CRM and sales agenda in a slightly different way. So one last question around uh, enabling or ensuring that people are following the right sales process. Um, 
so again, in my view on this, it's a bit carrot and stick. So if you make everything mandatory fields, for example, then sales guys won't fill anything out because if they don't know what the person's job role is, uh, they can't add the person record, they just won't add the person record. So you've got to get that balance right. Uh, but in my view, the most effective way to do this is use a combination of uh, exception reports. So if there are, um, and that's a, a bit like that um, red flag I showed you on the opportunity record for the finance director. If there are data that we know is really relevant to the sales process, we want to make sure the sales guys are capturing it, not just because we want them to capture it, because it demonstrates they know the answer to the question, who are the key contacts involved in this buying process. Um, and that's key. So I think it's about using those exception reports uh, and exception reports for the individual salesperson so they can easily monitor and measure uh, how well they're doing at managing the, the process. So you could, for example, think about scoring an opportunity from 1 to 100, with 100 being it's got all the fields filled in and we've got all the answers to all the questions, and 1 being we've got no idea what's going on, and look at rating your opportunities on that basis, and then using a similar approach to give you a sort of more holistic view of that um, best practice across the, uh, the sales team. So the last question I'm going to answer, because we're through the allotted time now, is around marketing integration. Do we integrate with marketing tools? Absolutely, we do. Uh, so there's a whole range of those on our website. So whether it's <coughs> excuse me, things like Dot Mailer, Mailchimp, uh, and others, uh, we integrate with a range of different marketing automation tools. And because we've got an open set of APIs, it's relatively easy for us to integrate with uh, any other, uh, relatively quickly and we also work very closely with an integration platform called Zapier which allows us to connect to lots of different systems. So for example, um, the webinar that you, you're all attending today is, has been run by GoToWebinar. We have an automation that's automatically capturing all your details from GoToWebinar and bringing it into CRM for us so we don't need to do that process manually. Uh, and we've done that via an integration with, with GoToWebinar via Zapier. Relatively simple to set up and a great example of where it's automating a process for us rather than our, our marketing team having to spend lots of time extracting data from go to webinar and sucking into workbooks. So for those of you that attended, you'll get a nice follow-up email. Uh, and for those of you that haven't attended, A, you won't hear this, but B, they'll, they'll get a separate email um, and saying we said we missed them and hopefully they can attend the next one. Uh, and a great example of auto how we can automate technology between different platforms to make uh, our, our team's life easier. So uh, thank you all for your time. I hope you found that useful. Uh, and as I say, the recording will be available on our website uh, in the relatively near future. The next webinar uh, will be in February on the 22nd at 10 a.m. And that's very much focused on account management. So um, different processes really for account management, similar themes, uh, but different processes. And we'll talk about some of those. So thank you all for your time.